Hello, this is your evil twin, welcoming you to Let's Play 20 Years of Half-Life. <coughs> Developed by Valve Software and published by Sierra, Half-Life was released on the 19th of November 1998. Although it was a first-person shooter, built using a modified version of the Quake engine, Valve wanted to create an immersive world rather than a shooting gallery. And they succeeded. They combined intense shooting action with sophisticated storytelling, believable environments, clever puzzles, and impressive artificial intelligence. Winner of over 50 Game of the Year awards, it was called the best PC game ever, game of the millennium, and best game of all time. Six years later, Valve repeated that success with Half-Life 2, another game that revolutionised the gaming industry. So let's go back and see what all the fuss was about. To start with, we're playing the original disc version of Half-Life 1. Some Half-Life veterans might recognise my name. Back in the day I did mod reviews for Planet Half-Life, and I wrote the first entries for the Planet Half-Life wiki. I also had my own website, The Lambda Project, dedicated to Half-Life's story. And now I'll be your guide through two decades of Half-Life games, expansions, and fan-made mods. So, this is original 1998 Half-Life, patched slightly to version 1009, a patch that came out April 1999. One nifty little feature is that each option has an underlined letter, so as well as selecting things with a mouse, you can also use keyboard shortcuts. Before we start playing, it's a good idea to adjust a few settings. Firstly, we should turn off auto-aim. I'd always recommend turning Half-Life's auto-aim off, because it centres your crosshair on the middle of enemies making it tricky to get headshots to hit other enemy weak points. The auto-aim is only helpful if you're completely new to shooters and you struggle to hit enemies at all. If we check the audio options, you can see I've got play CD music turned on. The Half-Life disc is part data disc, part music CD. And I've turned on EAX hardware support, so footsteps and gunshots in a cave will sound different than in an office. Normally EAX doesn't work on modern versions of Windows, but I'm using a tool called Creative Alchemy to emulate EAX hardware support. The Steam version of Half-Life uses the Miles sound system, which does the same job as EAX, but doesn't quite sound the same. Now this is important, video modes. Software mode is for computers without graphics cards. It gives everything a very retro, pixelated look, but it made the game playable for people that didn't have fancy gaming PCs. If you had a half-decent computer though, then you could select OpenGL or Direct3D, depending on the type of graphics card you had. The game does run slightly better in OpenGL mode, so that's what we're going to use. And we're playing in good old 1024 by 768 resolution, though I'm also forcing 2 times anti-aliasing using my graphics card's control panel. Half-Life does support higher resolutions, but the icons and numbers for health and weapons get smaller and smaller the higher you put the resolution. Now, I'd always recommend that newcomers play the Hazard course first. It's a tutorial stage that teaches you some important game mechanics that you might not figure out otherwise. However, for this Let's Play, we're going to skip the Hazard course for now, and instead take a look at it in a future video. I usually like to play Half-Life on the hardest difficulty setting, but for this Let's Play, I'll mostly be playing on Medium. I'll occasionally show off some bits in Difficult Mode, though. By the way, Half-Life doesn't come with any subtitles for dialogue, so I'm adding my own subtitles to these videos. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. This automated train is provided for the security and convenience of the Black Mesa Research Facility personnel. Oh dear, it looks like he's locked out. The time is 8.47 a.m. Current topside temperature is 93 degrees, with an estimated high of 105. So those guys have missed their train. The Black Mesa compound is maintained at a pleasant 68 degrees at all times. Now there's something funny about those officers we just passed. They don't have any doors. Or windows. They're just open alcoves. It's like the scientists are lab rats that some giant has picked up and plonked into cages. In the PlayStation 2 version, done by Gearbox Software, they added doors to those offices, 
as well as proper glass windows with window frames. This Let's Play will primarily be of the original PC version, but I'll also be including brief clips of PlayStation 2 Half-Life to show off some notable differences. This train is inbound from Level 3 Dormitories to Sector C Test Labs and Control Facilities. If your intended destination is a high security area beyond Sector C, you will need to return to the Central Transit Hub in Area 9 and board a high security train. If you have not yet submitted your identity to the retinal clearance system... Ah, oh, there's Gus, the forklift driver. Hi, Gus. ...personnel for processing before you will be permitted into the high security branch of the transit system. I'm guessing that's a sounding rocket, carrying scientific instruments for suborbital measurements. Due to the high toxicity of material routinely handled in the Black Mesa compound, no smoking, eating, or drinking are permitted within the Black Mesa transit system. This journey reminds me of Alton Towers theme park here in the UK. Once you've arrived at the front entrance, a monorail takes you into the park itself. Past roller coasters and water rides, while a voice tells you about the attractions and sets up the rules of the park. Passengers are to remain seated and await further instruction. Oh, an army helicopter. It is necessary to exit the train. The scientist is waving it off. Personnel should be evacuated first. It kind of looks like it just delivered something or dropped someone off, but that's an Apache attack helicopter. That'd be like driving to work in a tank or a fighter jet. Regardless, it does show that Black Mesa has military connections. The Black Mesa facility is supposed to be a decommissioned nuclear missile base. Some people compare it to Area 51, but a better comparison would be the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Like Black Mesa, it's in New Mexico, and it started as a secret facility for the design of atom bombs. After World War II, its existence was made public, and after the Cold War ended, they branched out into multidisciplinary research, fields such as space exploration, nuclear fusion, nanotechnology, all sorts of things. A reminder that the Black Mesa Hazard Course Decathlon will commence this evening at 1900 hours in the Level 3 facility. The semi-finals for high security personnel will be announced in a separate secure access transmission. I wonder what those machines do. They're like pistons, but with beams of plasma and rings of energy. Oh, and that scientist is locked out as well. ...friend or relative who would make a valuable addition to the Black Mesa team. Immediate openings are available in the areas of materials handling and low clearance security. Please contact Black Mesa personnel. That cargo train or tractor has misaligned textures. Gearbox fixed that in the PlayStation 2 version. Theoretical physics, biotechnology, or other high tech disciplines. Please contact our civilian recruitment division. The Black Mesa Research Facility is an equal opportunity employer. We've already passed through several giant doors like these, and down several elevators. We keep going deeper and deeper into the facility. Personnel. Regular radiation and biohazard screenings are a requirement of continued employment in the Black Mesa Research Facility. While our train stops to let this robot go past, we can take a look at the passengers of another stopped train. ...for immediate termination. If you feel you have been exposed to radioactive or other hazardous materials... A bit of a joke here. We pass a leak of glowing green ooze, just the voice talks about radiation safety. Work safe. Work smart. Your future depends on it. Oh, the irony. Now arriving at Sector C test labs and control facilities. Please stand back from the automated door and wait for the security officer to verify your identity. Before exiting the train, be sure to check your area for personal belongings. I don't think we brought Thank anything you. with us. And have a very safe and productive day. Morning, Mr. Freeman. Looks like you're running late. Watch his mouth move as he types in the door code. I think he's the one actually making the boop boop noises. It looks like he's mouthing the code numbers to help remember them. 
In this old version of Half-Life, your view rolls or leans when you sidestep left to right, similar to the Quake games. It was removed in later versions, perhaps because it made some people feel motion sick. Also, by default, you automatically run around everywhere, but you can press the shift key to walk, and that seems more appropriate during this early part of the game, rather than sprinting around the workplace like a crazy person. Now that's quite the impressive door. Very secure. Hey, catch me later, I'll buy you a beer. So this is the first proper character in the game, Barney. He's named after Barney Fife, the inept but well-meaning deputy sheriff from the Andy Griffith show. Barney is a security officer, and his job is to protect the facility's personnel, equipment, and materials. He's friendly, brave, and a useful ally. You can open doors that are locked by keypads or retinal scanners. He has 35 health points, and he is armed with a 9mm pistol. On easy and medium difficulty, that pistol does 5 damage per shot, while on difficult mode, the damage is up to 8 points. He has unlimited ammo, and although his model does have reloading animations, he never actually needs to reload during a fight, he can shoot forever. Nowadays, game characters might be made up of 40,000 polygons, or even 100,000, but Barney here is made up of just 785 polygons. That's actually four times more than characters in Quake 2, which came out just one year earlier. Something that really set Half-Life apart from other games was its skeletal animation system. Each character is given a set of bones underneath the model's skin. It is these bones that move, and the model deforms around them. This made it easier and more intuitive to animate characters, and lots of reviewers commented on how Half-Life's skeletal animations made characters extremely lifelike. In 2001, the expansion Half-Life Blue Shift came out, with an optional high-definition pack, which helped Half-Life keep with the times by adding new models with twice as many polygons. A few months later, the PlayStation 2 version of Half-Life was released, which has characters that are even more detailed, with facial expressions and moving eyes that can blink. For this playthrough, I'm playing original Half-Life exactly as it was back in the 90s, but when we get on to playing Blue Shift, I'll be using the high-definition models. Hello, sir. Anyway, Barney's right, we're already late for work, so we'll just have to catch him later. Don't forget about that beer you owe me! The game's ride into work does actually have a chapter name, Black Mesa Inbound. But now the intro is over, we'll get the first proper chapter, Anomalous Materials. Hey, that security guard. Isn't that Barney? We just saw him outside. Perhaps that's his brother, Bartley. Hey, Mr. Freeman. I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago, and I'm still trying to find my files. Just one of those days, I guess. They were having some problems down in the test chamber, too, but I think that's all straightened out. They told me to make sure you headed down there as soon as you got into your hazard suit. The wall is decorated with the logo for the Black Mesa facility, superimposed on a world map. There's actually a white dot marking the location of Black Mesa in the United States. I hope those containment parameters are still nominal. Well, Walter, my old chum, you would know better than me. This is Walter, although originally he was just known as Glasses, or Nerd. But then Planet Half-Life started a popular weekly feature known as Walter's World, a diary of a glasses-wearing scientist named Walter Bennett. You could write into Walter and he would answer questions. In honour of this, the name Walter got some official use in Half-Life Opposing Force and Blue Shift, and the high-definition version of his face texture is named Walter, and that was carried over to the PS2 version as well. Now, Gordon is just a research associate, but many scientists like Walter have research and development positions, planning experiments and creating new technologies. Unfortunately, he isn't much good in a fight. If things get dangerous, he might freeze and cower in fear, or panic and run around the place screaming. Can't really blame him though, he doesn't have any weapons, and his low health of 20 hit points means he can be killed by pretty much anything. However, like security officers, he can activate retinal scanners to unlock doors, and also he can administer first aid. 
If your health drops below 50%, Walter can pull out a syringe and inject you with a green liquid that restores 25 health points. Excuse me, Gordon, but I'm rather busy now. Oh really, Walter? I suppose you won't mind if I go over here and use this. Get away from there, Freeman. I'm expecting an important message. As I suspected. You're just hanging around, waiting for some Walter's World fan emails, aren't you? How about your colleague, eh? Pretending to help Bartley with his computer problems? Hmm, you look awfully familiar. Yeah, no prizes for guessing who this scientist is based on. He's Einstein. I'm sure in the next room we'll be chatting with Nikola Tesla, Isaac Newton and Marie Curie. And when using the high definition models, or the PlayStation 2 models, his face textures are actually named Einstein. So there's no doubt about it, we're working with the guy who developed the special and general theories of relativity. Let's see what you eggheads make of this. My god, hey, what that. are you doing? Come on, Gordon. You trying to get me into trouble? <laughs> Right, now this is Sector C, but it's actually just a map of this upper floor of the Anomalous Materials Labs. So we're actually just looking at the tip of the iceberg. This should shake up those grand unification boys, hmm? Shut up! The Anomalous Materials Labs are made up of a number of colour-coded zones that are spread over three floors. Half Left Decay, the two-player cooperative expansion on PlayStation 2, adds another couple of floors beneath all this. There are two access points, the main entrance in the lobby, where we are now, and a guarded airlock that leads to Sector B. There are two zones on this floor, the first is Research, colour-coded red, and Personnel Facilities, which is the green zone. And beyond a secure airlock, there's an elevator down to Development, the blue zone. In the development section, we'll need to make our way past the ionisation chambers, control room and plasma cells to reach a small elevator that leads down to the test chamber, Test Lab C33-A, the anti-mass spectrometer. It's all pretty elaborate. We can follow these coloured lines on the walls to reach the various sections. Wouldn't it be fantastic to get some pure readings for a change? Red for research, blue for development, green for personnel facilities. This kind of detail really helps it to feel like a real workplace. Ah, hello, Gordon Freeman. It's good to see you. Good to see you too, Slick. I wonder if I should test again. I have no doubt. Greetings. Hello, Luther. Oh, Slick. Wait a minute, didn't we just pass you? Ah, hello, Gordon Freeman. It's good to see you. And you said that exact same thing. Black Mesa stuff by clones. Are we working in collaboration with the Dyad Institute? Yes, Half-Life has four scientist models and one security guard model, and they get used over and over. Any ideas on the origin of that new sample? Perhaps. Now, this scientist on the left is Luther. Although he has the same voice lines as the white scientists, when Luther speaks, the pitch is lowered slightly to give him a deeper voice. He didn't really have a name when Half-Life was first released, but later in the High Definition pack, in the PS2 version, Gearbox Software gave his face texture the name Luther. Don't you think we should recalculate those resonance dampening factors again? I really don't know. And this scientist on the right is known as Slick. Like Luther, he didn't originally have a name, he was just Scientist 4. But the high definition and PS2 versions of him have the name Slick in his face texture. The scientists and security guards have tables of random questions and answers to generate randomised conversations between them. Whether the answers make sense can be a bit hit or miss, though. Are you sure you checked the Eigen attenuators? Theoretically. What do you mean, theoretically? Either you did or you didn't. Hello there. I like how he turned to look at us when he heard someone come in. Good morning, Gordon. Big day today, Freeman. The sample was just delivered to the test chamber. 
you been able to get the beverage machine to work yet? Back in the 90s, you only saw this kind of thing in adventure games and role-playing games. Half-Life was the first shooter to populate its world with non-player characters chatting with each other, rather than just enemies trying to kill you. Now we saw this man in the suit back during the train ride. Unlike the scientists and security guards, this isn't supposed to be another person who happens to use the same model. This is actually meant to be the same guy we saw earlier. Can't make up what they're saying. Can't get in, either. Looks like some kind of bureaucrat. It makes sense in an institution like this. As well as scientists and security guards, you'd have administrators, tax guys, government guys who check over the books and represent some other interest. I wonder how he got here before us. Did he walk past while we were in the computer room? He's nicknamed the G-Man. That's a slang term meaning government man, though it's usually used to refer to FBI agents. His briefcase has the Black Mesa logo on it, though in an odd pre-release of Half-Life it was a Department of Defence logo. In the high definition pack, at first the G-Man looked like this. And then the Blue Shift 1.01 patch updated the model to have a much better face shape. I love that he has a little bit of a wry smile, like he's thinking about some private joke. Unfortunately that was lost in the PlayStation 2 version. Despite having blinking eyes and facial expressions, I actually feel the PS2 G-Man was a step back compared to the patched Blue Shift High Definition G-Man. Back in the old days, a very popular theory was that the G-Man was actually the administrator of the Black Mesa facility, in charge of everything. That may not actually be the case, but he certainly has some kind of position of authority. Sector B. You got the wrong airlock, Mr. Freeman. You know I can't let you through here. Oh, come on, Barnaby. We're buddies. Can we do this later? Let me through. I won't tell anyone. Sorry, I'm on duty, Mr. Freeman. Hmm, I guess we're not such good buddies after all. Must have been getting you confused with your identical cousin. I like to think of all the security guards as being like Pokemon characters. Every town in Pokemon has an Officer Jenny and a Nurse Joy. And every Black Mesa checkpoint has a Barney. Ah, hello, Gordon Freeman. It's good to see you. Hello. Now, well, here's a peculiar little detail. This room is a working light switch. My god, what are you doing? I love that they put in all these little practical jokes to reward players that explore and interact with everything. You aren't going soft on that ethics issue again, are you? Don't be ridiculous. Well, that's everything to see and do in the research section. Did you submit your status report to the administrator today? I couldn't even venture a guess. So, let's follow the blue line and head down to development. Ah, it's good to see you. Which scientists say hello is random every time you play. Yes, this all looks nominal. Please, leave me alone until after the experiment. When you press the use button on a scientist, I'm not sure if you're actually meant to be speaking to them, or just Hello there. tapping them on the shoulder or something. Sorry Mr. Freeman, I got explicit orders not to let you through without your hazard suit on. Ah right, hazard suit, hazard suit. Hey, do you have any idea where I can grab a hazard suit? Weren't you supposed to be in the test chamber half an hour ago? Those containment parameters are still nominal. I can't be bothered right now. That's odd. Oh? What's the problem? Perhaps I can help. Excuse me, Gordon, but I'm rather busy now. <laughs> Fine then. Right, this is the green section. Personnel facilities. Greetings! Hello there! Now, where did I leave that shutdown procedure chart? Oh, well, the vending machine went fine for me. Can I get you a drink, Walter? Someone's hidden my glasses again. Um, you're wearing them. I bet you forgot to put money in the vending machine. There's steam rising from that coffee cup. Please, leave me alone until after the experiment. My god, what are you doing? Um, I can't be bothered right now. Leave me alone until after the experiment. As I expected. 
Black Mesa is supposed to be an equal opportunities employer, but we haven't seen any women. Valve did actually design a female scientist model. Valve wanted to have a wide range of characters, but apparently they just didn't have the texture read memory. Half-Life's writer, Mark Laidlaw, joked that all the women stayed home today. They knew there was something going on. At least there was Gina, the hazard course instructor. And on PlayStation 2, Half-Life was the co-op campaign Decay, where you play as Gina and another female scientist, Colette. Freeman? Why do we all have to wear these ridiculous ties? Most of the simulation results are perfectly acceptable, you know. The names on the lockers are actually all surnames of Valve employees that worked on the game. Except for Gordon Freeman's own locker, that is. There's a couple of toilet cubicles, and if we crouch we can see they are actually occupied. We can't use the sink, Hello. in fact it looks like it's blocked, but we can use the hand dryer. In the PlayStation 2 version, Gearbox Software added some interesting conversations between the scientists and the toilet stalls. I believe something smells quite foul here. You are completely wrong. What is that stench? I must remember to report that fluctuation. <clears throat> Are you 100% sure that theory of yours is correct? I really don't know. Shouldn't we try to capture a specimen? You can't be serious. Do you smell what I smell? It can't get any worse than this. I... I can't hold on much longer. Thank God you're here! The sample was just delivered to the test chamber. The sample was just delivered to the test chamber. Must remember to report that fluctuation. <laughs> uh, now, let's check out what's in Gordon Freeman's locker. There's a hazard suit battery. That'll be useful in a minute. Some clothing, a certificate, sticky notes, a thermos and mug, and a couple of books. The Orchid Eater and the 37th Mandala. Both are real-life novels by Half-Life writer Mark Laidlaw. He's got a locker in here as well. There's also this baby picture. Now you might be thinking that this is supposed to be our kid, but Half-Life's instruction manual starts with a two-page letter confirming Gordon's offer of employment at Black Mesa. And it mentions that you're unmarried and without dependents. So this photo isn't Gordon's child. Could be his niece, or something like that, though. It's actually just an easter egg. This is Isabel, the daughter of two married Valve employees. The dad is artist and designer Harry Teasley, and the mum is texture artist Yatsi Mark. Originally, Harry put the photo in the game on a desk in some random office, while Gordon's locker was decorated with a poster of Xena Warrior Princess. Yes, this all looks nominal. But later, level designer John Guthrie modified the locker, got rid of the Xena poster, and put the photo of Isabel in there instead. Now here are the hazard suit chambers. Looks like two of them are already in use, but there's still one suit left for us in the middle. The hazardous environment suit is like a cross between a hazmat suit and some kind of power armour. Welcome to the HEV Mark IV protective system for use in hazardous environment conditions. High impact reactive armor activated. Atmospheric contaminant sensors activated. Vital sign monitoring activated. Automatic medical systems engaged. Defensive weapon selection system activated. Munition level monitoring activated. Communications interface online. Have a very safe day. I love this trance music. So 90s. It's fun to imagine that it's not just part of the game's soundtrack, but that the suit itself is playing it as part of its boot up sequence. 
Now if we use some cheat codes to go into third person mode, we can see what Gordon looks like. We can see that he's got a ponytail, a detail that was dropped in Half-Life 2. Half-Life fans disagree about whether Gordon is supposed to be wearing a helmet. A hazmat suit for protection against radiation and chemicals would be pretty useless if it didn't cover your face, but when we got our suit, we didn't see a helmet in the suit chamber, and Gordon's player model doesn't have one. But some of the game's promotional artwork does show Gordon holding a helmet, and later on we'll see other HEV suits that have helmets equipped. Gordon's also meant to be wearing glasses, though they didn't put that on his player model either. He's got them in the PlayStation 2 version though, and most of the game's artwork shows him with glasses. The HEV computer voice did mention a heads-up display, that's the health and armour numbers that appear on the screen, so it makes sense for us to be wearing a helmet to see that, unless it's some kind of hologram projected in front of Gordon's eyes, and a sci-fi energy shield protecting his head from radiation. Gordon has different poses for every weapon in the game. They're used in multiplayer and make it easier to tell what someone is armed with. When you don't have a weapon, rather than having Gordon's hands by his side or something, he runs around the anomalous materials labs giving all his colleagues the thumbs up. I wonder if I should run that test again. Yes, you should definitely run that test again. Thumbs up. Thumbs up to that. Now that we've got the HEV suit, we can pick up the battery in Gordon's locker. Power 15%. On easy and medium difficulty, batteries give your suit 15% power, while in difficult mode it's just 10%. The suit still provides some protection without power. This is all within theoretical limits. But batteries charge up the suit's reactive armor, providing greater protection. Go right on through, sir. Looks like you're in the barrel today. Bartleby is using a retinal scanner. The flashing orange picture is a scan of the back of his eyeball. The PlayStation 2 version has fancy models for the retinal scanners, with an animation of a crosshair scanning parts of the retinal image. Dr. Victor, report to Super Cool Laser Laboratory, please. This area is decorated with these Black Mesa advertisement boards. Technology! Working as a team! In the PlayStation 2 version, Gearbox replaced some of the textures so they'd match the look of the new PlayStation 2 characters. Dr. Johnson, please call observation tank one. On the other side, there's adverts about the Black Mesa region, a hydroelectric dam, safety, and the Black Mesa Security Force, which actually uses a picture of an old beta version of the Barney model. Launch officer reports. Alpha satellite deploy is nominal. Of course, in the PlayStation 2 version, they replaced that picture. By the way, you see all that little writing? It says something like, If you can read this a bit, then you're really freaking strange with good eyes. I need text of internet here. No, really, go ahead and picture something cool in your mind eye. Make something up of what you'd like for this to say. Dr. Cross, call 729, please. I wonder if that could be a message for Dr. Gina Cross from the Hazard Course and Half-Life Decay. The Black Mesa announcement system, also known as Vox, has a big list of random announcements it can make. You're never likely to hear them all in one playthrough. Interestingly, some of them seem to be for military personnel or government agents. Coded message for Captain Black, Command and Communication Center, or Agent Kuma, report to Topside Tactical Operations Center. So, although this is a civilian run facility, there seem to be some soldiers and federal agents stationed here. Some kind of generator here. Do you think we should delay for another recalibration? Who can say? This generator was made much more impressive in the PS2 version. Is anyone else getting hungry? Didn't you just ask me that? Sergeant Bailey to Topside Checkpoint Bravo. Have you seen my coffee cup? I 
Control room, test lab access, plasma cells, ionization chambers. Greetings. Greetings! Caution, laser. That's odd. The PS2 version, they opened up sections of the ceiling and added these lasers being refracted by prisms. Hey, catch me later, I'll buy you a beer. Now these are the ionization chambers. They look like tanks of water, but there's a corrosive warning next to them. Every few seconds, the chambers mist up a bit and then become clear again. And if you press your face right up to the glass, there's a very faint crackle of electricity between the two metal plates. In the PS2 version, Gearbox redesigned the ionization chambers. On the one hand, the design was simplified to make them simple cylinders. On the other hand, they were made much more dramatic of these noisy electrical discharges. And liquid churning round and round. No corrosive warning sign anymore, though. Right, let's switch back to the PC version again. The test chamber control room. Raymond. Ah, Gordon, here you are. We just sent the sample down to the test chamber. We've boosted the anti mass spectrometer to 105%. Bit of a gamble, but we need the extra resolution. The administrator is very concerned that we get a conclusive analysis of today's sample. I gather they went to some lengths to get it. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the test chamber. Ah, and there's the test chamber itself. Say, um, I have a few questions about exactly what it is we're doing here. Please, leave me alone until after the experiment. Excuse me, Gordon, but I'm rather busy now. I just wanted a quick run-through of the procedure. You'll just have to wait until after the test. Ugh, fine. But if I break something, it's not my fault. These are the plasma tubes. Crackles of red electricity. That's weird. Normally, when electricity passes through air, it looks blue. Is that machine full of neon gas? Anyway, it seems like they fixed the problem. They got to it in time. It's not our job to worry about that sort of thing. We're just a research associate. The employment letter in the Half-Life Instruction Manual says that you've been working at the University of Innsbruck in Austria, and that you're recommended by Dr. Kleiner, your former professor at MIT. Most of the simulation results are perfectly acceptable, you know. Right. Test lab C33-A. I'm afraid we'll be deviating a bit from standard analysis procedures today, Gordon. Yes, but with good reason. This is a rare opportunity for us. This is the purest sample we've seen yet. And, potentially, the most unstable. Now, now, if you follow standard insertion procedures, everything will be fine. I don't know how you can say that, although I will admit that the possibility of a resonance cascade scenario is extremely unlikely. Gordon doesn't need to hear all this. He's a highly trained professional. We've assured the administrator that nothing will go wrong. Ah, uh, yes, you're right. Gordon, we have complete confidence in you. Well, go ahead. Let's let him in now. Ah, two-man key system. Is that really necessary? I'm not launching a new car, are we? So this is the anti-mass spectrometer. Back in the day, some fans thought this meant something to do with antimatter. Others figured it was meaningless technobabble. My own theory that I put forward on my Lambda Project website and the Planet Half-Life wiki was that it was a device for analysing exotic matter that has negative mass. I like 
the detail of the switch having a protective cover that opens when the control room authorizes it. Then again, is there any good reason to have someone in here just to press the switch? Surely this console could be in the main control room. Alrighty then. My theory that anti-mass means negative mass exotic matter was always just a theory, but it's become commonly accepted by the Half-Life fan community. The modern Half-Life wiki still has word-for-word -word reproductions of my old articles on the subject. Black Mesa, the Source Engine remake of Half-Life, has whiteboards quoting my theories about exotic matter and negative energy, which made me feel quite proud. My mark on Half-Life history. Scientists have theorised that negative energy or negative mass could be used to make wormholes and warp drives. Ouch! If you get too close, you get a little electrical zap. If you actually step into the beams, then it's lethal. Standard insertion for a non standard specimen. Go ahead, Gordon. Slot the carrier into the analysis port. Couldn't they have gotten a robot arm to do this? Why do we have to be in here? What is he doing in there? Nothing you need. Oh well, let's just do what we're paid to do. We better pull it out. Oh no! There's a beam of energy arcing between the machine and the crystal. And some weird creatures are appearing in mid-air, falling and then disappearing again. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join me next time for Unforeseen Consequences.